question of how employers should become aware of the social issues. I think they, what do they do once they become aware of them? The how is simple. Do a, do a basic Google search, legal side of social media, legal issues, social media, and you will get pages and pages of either articles on it. You may find some cases uh, described about it, but unless you go through all of it and read all of it and see the different angles where it's coming from, it can be overwhelming. So the how is simple. Listen to this video right now. You're aware of some of the issues, but the general concept that I think I want employers and business owners to know is, look, if it's illegal in the real world, it's going to be Ill illegal in the virtual world. And for employers, they have they have a tightrope balancing act that they have to manage. One, there's that basic principle of that they can be responsible, liable for the acts of their employees or agents that are acting within the scope of their employment or agency. So if an employee says something on behalf of the company and it is found to be false, defamation, or an employee copies uh, someone else's work and posts it on the internet, the employer may be subject to a copyright infringement or defamation claim. So employers have that interest to protect and monitor what the employees say or do on social media, on the one hand. On the other hand, employees have rights to talk and discuss about the terms and conditions of their employment under the National Labor Relations Act, which covers most, most employers. And in those instances, terms and conditions of employment, the NLRB, which is the National Labor Relations Board, that regulates and oversees the NLRA, has construed it broadly in favor of the employees. In the last couple years have found policies of the employers that are geared toward protecting the employer's image, protecting their IP, but is being overly broad and interfering into the employee's rights. So in managing social media, it's understanding that there's more than just one area of law that comes into play. And sometimes you have to balance between complying with the different legal interests at the same time. There's the world of social media, right? And in that world, you have the Facebook, the LinkedIn, the blogs, the employers or the businesses' web pages, the Twitter accounts, the YouTubes. The world is huge. And the virtual world has a huge population in it. And as that population is growing and people are using it, more, more and more laws come into play. Uh, the legal issues can involve copyright, trademark issues, business owners and employers. You want to protect your own intellectual property, your copyrights, your trademarks, your patents. You want to make sure your trade secrets don't get published out on the internet because now if they do, they may lose their trade secret status. And at the same token, you don't want to violate or infringe upon someone else's copyrights, trademarks, um, inappropriately misappropriate someone else's trade secrets on the website, engage in unfair competition tactics and how you do advertising on the website. So there's, so you have intellectual property issues, advertisement regulation issues, um, legal issues with regard to your employment and in relationship with your employees, basic tort common law claims for defamation. There's internet defamation claims, um, negligence type claims can come up based on activities that are present on the social media. So when I look at the world of social media, I look at all the stuff, the different venues that business owners can uh, participate in, and I see red flags or potential liability issues. And it doesn't mean that they shouldn't do it. It means just proceed with caution and do it in a way that doesn't violate the law, just as you would in the real world. So everyone who posts on social media could be susceptible to um, different legal issues. However, some businesses or professions have a higher burden or more responsibilities on them because their particular business or profession is regulated. For instance, lawyers. We're regulated by the state bar. The state bar association has guidelines on what lawyers can and cannot do on social media. So the, in the general response, any business or profession that's regulated they need to make sure that they're following the regulations of their business. Advertisers, FTC. Finance people, FINRA. Um, 
lawyers, you have the State Bar Association. So if your business is regulated, you want to make sure that you comply with those. Um, and basically, a lot of the overriding principles of the different regulatory things is don't engage in deceptive conduct or information. Don't post false information out there. Adhere to the professional regulations of your profession. A company's intellectual property can be some of their most valuable assets. Social media presents a way where they can lose some of their protection. So when I'm looking at social media, it's twofold. One, a company wants to protect their intellectual property, their copyrights, their trademarks, their trade secrets, um, and they don't want to infringe upon others. So where that com comes into play um, may be in your descriptions of if you have an employee assigned to post things for you, or you want to add videos or photographs to make something interesting and exciting to look at, make sure you have permission to use the photograph. You're not infringing on someone else's rights by, infringing, by posting that photograph. For your own intellectual property, if you're posting something, say your business does an ebook. Obviously, you have an interest of wanting that ebook to be read by lots of people. But you don't want people to maybe copy and paste it at will, take things out of context. So when you post that ebook, right under there, on there, you can write, this is your, you know, make sure it gives notice that it's your copyright. And then you can explain that you get permission for people to use it in its entirety. And that way it's signaling other users of it how they can use your information and you serve your purpose. So it's just issues like that. Be mindful of what your intellectual property is. Protect it, put the appropriate notices in place, uh, protect who can copy it. Maybe some instance you don't want people to download it, maybe you do. Make sure you know what it is and you can take the appropriate measures to protect it. And at the same time, have instructions in place for your staff to not willy-nilly just copy other people's works on the internet. Just because you do a search for an image, even if you think Google images, doesn't mean that it is fair game. You have to actually look at the image itself and see if there's a notice or a copyright restriction. Because I've done searches too where I've seen that and there's been an image that looks really cool, I want to use it, and then I, you can see, usually it's at the bottom of it, or to the right of it, or if you right click on it, sometimes it comes up. It will say, this is copyright protected. If you want to use it, do X, Y, or Z. I think the one that I wanted to use for a presentation recently, it was I had to join the, um, the organization. It was a business that was compiling images. It was for free. And then I had to, when I used it, I had to give that website credit. So they allowed me to use it for free as long as I gave them credit. I did that. The different terms are going to be different for each photo. Some photos are free, or they say everyone can use it, but if you don't, the best approach is, unless it's very clear that it's authorizing anyone to use it, don't just use it. I mean, think of it if it was your work and you want to protect it. Um, just because it's out there doesn't mean it's, just because it's out on the internet doesn't mean it's in the public domain for you to use. So I would, looking at images, I would look at the image, see if there's any copyright notice or protections on it, and then if it's something that I want to use, look at does it give me some notice as to what I can use, how I can use it, and follow it. Always try to get permission first, and then if you can't get permission um, and can't follow the guidelines, then you can do an assessment as to whether or not it falls under the fair use doctrine of copyright law, which just gives you some limited uses on how you can use images or copyright works of others. But that's not a clear-cut um, rule. It's, an, it's an a factoring analysis that courts will look at, and it depends on the case by case. So proceed with caution. So a very broad policy of employees can never post confidential information of the employer reviewing recent decisions of the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board, that policy would most likely be found to violate the National Labor Relations Act because it doesn't clearly define confidential information and confidential information could be broad enough to include topics about the terms and conditions of the employment. Let me give you an example. Say an employee has the right under the NLRA to talk about wages, talk about overtime. 
And if an employer or if an employee is looking at that policy that says employees shall not post confidential information on any social media website, and it's possible to have a chilling effect on the employee from commenting about their wages, or for an employee to think that includes me talking about my wages or the terms and conditions of my employment, overtime, or things of that nature, then it violated the NLRB. So when employees or when employers draft policies for their employees, they need to really, one, identify the legitimate business dis purpose for the policy, for the practice, make sure that they're aware of the other ancillary laws that may come into play so that they can draft the policy to further their business decision or their business purpose, such as protecting their intellectual property, without violating other laws, such as the National Labor Relations Board, or National Labor Relations Act, which is governed by the National Labor Relations Board. I like to share some stories of incidents of social media posts or social media usage that got entangled in litigation or at least claims from one party or the other. One had to do with an employee whose her job was to post messages on behalf of the employee on a Twitter account. During the course of her job, she uh, developed 17,000 followers. When the employer terminated her employment, she wanted to take that Twitter account with her and the followers with, the followers with her. The employer said, you know what, you're doing this as part of your job for us. It's our account. Those followers are ours, not yours. No, you can't. I wish I could tell you the legal analysis that a court rendered on that case, but I can't because it's settled out of court. But it raises some issues for employers to think about who owns these type of issues? A prudent employer or business owner at the front of any type of situation will make sure and specify it and contract that out with the employee who's going to do this so that they know from the front end, this is ours, you agree that it's ours, if the employment relationship is terminated, this is ours. Deal with those issues first, but you need to be aware of them so that you can deal with them. Another interesting one was a LinkedIn account. And I think this was an upper level executive or manager, or at least at the upper level management level position, had her LinkedIn account that referenced her employment with the business. And then when she, as part of her job, she would have her secretary post things on the LinkedIn account. So her secretary had her administrative password and, or the password to access the account. She was terminated when she left. The secretary, you know, under instructions from the higher up the executives of the company took that LinkedIn page and pretty much held it hostage. They changed the password so that the former, now former employee couldn't access it. And they changed all the experience and stuff so that it all dealt with the company and her replacement, even though if someone went to LinkedIn and did a search for her name, this page would come up that would no longer reference her but her replacement. That also ended up in litigation and was, was settled as well. Then you look at, this is where a common law claim comes into the virtual world of social media, internet defamation. In this case, a doctor um, you know, was taking care of a patient. The patient's son did not like how the doctor was treating the patient. So the patient's son did a Facebook post, or I'm not sure if it was Facebook, some social media post that called the doctor a real tool. The doctor didn't like being called a real tool on social media, and instead of letting it go, he probably did something that, you know, he filed a lawsuit. He, how he handled it probably made it bigger and more attention. Had he not done this, I probably would not be talking to you about it right now. He filed a lawsuit claiming that this patient's son defamed him on the internet by calling him a real tool. The court said, no, that's not defamation, and went through this eloquent analysis of how someone being a tool is an opinion and not a fact, and a pure opinion does not constitute defamation. So now that we have case law out there that we know that a real tool is pure opinion. The doctor didn't let that go, and I think he appealed it, and the son, I think, posted something again, and he was thinking about filing another lawsuit. 
I think there are probably a lot more people out there that share the same opinion of the sun right now. So those are just instances on what you say, how you say it, how you handle it, their legal issues, and also business, uh, business issues relating to them. When you go on to different sites like LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, they all have terms of use. And some of those terms of use, when you click on them, and, and it's, you know, you click on, do I agree to the terms of use, yes or no, and then you actually have to click on to the terms of use and you get all the small print that, you know, that lawyers are known for, read the small print. Because I'll talk, LinkedIn, Facebook, you're assigning the right for them to use your work uh, beyond, you know, however they want. So make sure that you know that if it's a photograph that you're putting on LinkedIn and Facebook, look at the terms of use, look at the part that says assignment, and if I can, I'll read you a part of LinkedIn's assignment, which it says, so LinkedIn says, you own the information, you, you provide LinkedIn under this agreement and may request its election at any time, or may request its deletion at any time, unless you have shared information or content with others and they have not deleted it or it was copied or stored by other users. That part's good. You retain ownership of it. The next sentence. Additionally, you grant LinkedIn a non-exclusive, irre irrevocable, worldwide, perpetual, unlimited, assignable, sub-licensable, fully paid up and royalty-free right to us to copy prepare derivative works, improve, distribute, publish, remove, retain, add, process, analyze, use, and commercialize in any way known or in the future discovered any information you provide directly or indirectly to LinkedIn. That's a pretty broad assignment. So make sure you don't want to post everything on LinkedIn. Some things are good, some things you want them to distribute. This is just one thing I think or recommend businesses, individuals, entrepreneurs, anyone, before you just say yes on the term of use, really read it and know what you're agreeing to. There's the legal side of social media that employers face on things that probably come up on a day-to-day -day basis for them. And as a background to this, it's just once mindful to know if it's illegal in the real world, it's illegal in the virtual world. So if that means that the discrimination statutes come into play, the, um, the FMLA comes into play, the ADA comes into play, monitoring the employee's email brings in some Electronic Communication Decency Act comes into play, Stored Communication Act comes into play. There are a lot of laws that govern the workplace and those extend onto the, into social media. Some common areas where it may come up on a day-to-day -day basis is, should I, as an employer, look into a prospective applicant's social media pages before I hire the employee? There are proponents that say yes, absolutely. There are some people that say no. And here's the issue that's faced. When you're hiring an applicant, you have to make sure that your decision to not hire them is based on a legitimate business decision. You can't refuse to hire someone based on a protected class. I hate all women, so I'm not going to hire a woman. That would violate Title VII. Um, I don't like hiring people with disabilities. That would violate the ADA. Where a social media situation comes into play, say you are looking into someone's social media pages before you hire them, and you find out, someone posted on their Facebook page, congratulations, you completed your first two weeks of AA. And now you know that that person at least could be a recovering alcoholic or was an alcoholic, or I guess once was a you know, recovering alcoholic, but is undergoing treatment for it. If they're undergoing treatment part of an AA or similar type activity, now that may bring them in protections under the American with Disability Act. If you don't hire them based on that, now maybe you just violated the ADA. However, now you look at the other side of the count, uh, the other side of the coin. Say you are a trucking company and you're considering hiring this person to drive a truck. You don't look at their social media page, you don't find anything out. You hire the person 
and within two weeks of being hired, they cause an accident because they're driving drunk. Someone, maybe the injured party, is going to say, look, if you would have just taken five seconds to look at this person's social media page, then you would not have hired this person and put them in a position that could have, that, that clearly caused this car accident. Therefore, you're negligently responsible you, um, in hiring this person. So you can see that same set of facts, depending on the circumstances, that's why I say a lot of times employers um, have a tightrope when they are managing their employees in the social media thing. The, the common way, or I guess the best practices way of how to approach this, make sure when you're making an employment decision or you're going to look at social media pages or you're, you are in the process of hiring an applicant, list out the legitimate business decisions, the legitimate business factors first. So that's always clear that what you are doing is based on legitimate business reason. And just know the risks of accessing the social media pages first may bring you into information that shows that the person was in a protected class that you otherwise would not have known. And now that person, if they prove that you looked at their social media pages, may try to claim that you didn't hire them because of that protected class. So that's just one area where it comes up, it's kind of gray, it's a little murky, and it definitely can be problematic or cause some turmoil. But have the legitimate business decisions down or legitimate business reason for your decision for hiring the person, have that clear. And obviously legitimate business reason is some, it's non-discriminatory, it's tied to the business goals and objectives. Another situation would be should I monitor my employees' emails? Or can I? Yes, you can if you follow certain guidelines. One is the employees have to know that they don't, that they should not expect privacy on their emails or their internet or their computer usage. You have to have that notice in place. That could be in your employee handbook. So it's one of the th other is when you look at your employee policies, you want to make sure these are in place. They use social media to generate business. And one way that they do this is holding sweepstakes to generate people's interest in their website, draw them to the website, to their business, to their product, and it's fine. Sweepstakes by themselves are fine. However, if not done correctly, sweepstakes in reality can be what's considered an illegal lottery. So when someone's, when you're a business and you're thinking you want to have or hold a sweepstakes, Make sure you're not inadvertently having an illegal lottery because you will have legal consequences of it. So very general, um, a lottery is something where someone pays a fee to enter and then the prize is awarded based on random selection, the lottery. A sweepstakes cannot be like that. So a sweepstakes, if there is a paid fee, then the selection of the winner has to be based on some type of judgment of skill, creativity, work, or something like that. If there's not a paid fee, then the selection of the winner must be at random. So you can't have a paid fee and random selection because that would make it an illegal lottery. The sweepstakes also has to make sure that their official rules and regulations are posted so people know how the winner is going to be selected, who's going to do the selection process, how it's going to be run, and there are other requirements that you have to follow. And again, I'm just the main thing is do not inadvertently run an illegal lottery because you will get in trouble. The general approach as business owners or employers should take when using social media is once again the two principles. If it's illegal in the real world, it's illegal in the virtual world. As an employer and business owner, you want to protect your intellectual property as well as not take or steal the intellectual property of another. And as an employer, you could be responsible for the acts of your employees or agents, such as independent contractors, as long as they're acting within the scope of their agency or employment. So you need to have some protections in place. And when you do that, the underlying principle or the underlying premise of why you're taking the action, your legitimate, non-discriminatory business reason, have that outlined, have it laid out so that you can show why you're taking this action. You're not, you're not posting something on social media to discriminate against your employees. You're not taking stuff on social media for that aspect. And then above all, and I almost hate how this sounds, 
call your lawyer um, or, or call your marketing specialist. Call and get the advice because you do not want to get into trouble. Social media pages are being used at evidence and trials and courts. So when, you know, it used to be the saying, imagine that something's on a billboard for everyone to see on the highway. Your billboard or your highway is a lot larger now and a lot more people are seeing it on social media. So make sure that you are proceeding with caution, but use it to its advantage. It's a good business tool. Mm -hmm.